Welcome to Life Devotions, and thank you for joining me today. I am obligated is the title of this devotion. I don't know about you, but I have obligation on me. You know, I, I'm 60 years old today. I'm obligated to live physically in, in such a way that I provide the Lord the vessel through which He can fulfill His purpose on the earth in me. I mean, the Bible says our body is not our own, but it's a temple of God's Holy Spirit. And when He says it's not our own, it's been bought at a price. This is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18 through 20. Our body, my body is the temple of God's Spirit. And, and, and the Bible says in Romans 12, present your body to the Lord holy, acceptable, well-pleasing, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of the Father. And so I'm obligated to take care of this body and what I eat and, and, and what I yield it to, what I, and how I take care of it. And I don't mean to say this to anybody who maybe says, I've not taken good care of my body to make you feel bad, but to encourage you, you know? And, I, and, and here I'm not sitting as the hero, uh, hello, hello. For years and years I kept saying, I, I'm gonna start jogging and I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And finally I said, Lord, this is not healthy. I, a man who says, but doesn't do is, is not pleasing to you. And I repent of this Lord and I play, help me. And, and, and the Lord helped me by His Spirit. And it helps me take care of my body by doing a bit of jogging a couple of times a week. I'm not religious about it. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But, but I do find that when you get older, you, you got to do what you can to provide your body to the Lord. But my, that would be the least obligation. And my greatest obligation is to live holy by the indwelling life of the Spirit. But I'm obligated to, to Virginia as a husband to live holy, to present myself to her as completely hers in Christ and for our oneness. I'm obligated to my children and grandchildren. I'm obligated as a pastor to this church that the Lord's given me the privilege to be a pastor together with amazing people. You know, I'm really obligated to live a life that is worthy of the gospel and honorable to, to God and the people and, and to not allow myself to get too low that I would behave in a way that's not honorable. And, and that, that's, you know, you got to live above reproof, the scripture says. So I have obligations on me in so many different ways, but mostly, I'm obligated to the Lord. And I want to read you this scripture here from Romans chapter 1, verse 14. The Apostle Paul says here, Romans 1, verse 14 through 17, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest to them for God has shown it to them. And the Apostle Paul felt a incredible obligation to God to make known the good news. You know, I was listening to Holy in Christ a book by Andrew Murray narrated. And while I was listening to it, he made a certain statement how in years past, the Moors would enslave people from different nations and take them to foreign lands where they were completely destroyed in their soul 
by being owned by another man and, and treated often quite harshly in doing work for the other person. And family and friends and governments would do whatever it takes to buy their freedom from the slave owners. And while the ransom was paid for their freedom, many times the news that the ransom was paid did not reach them and the slave owners was glad not to tell them not to lose them as their slaves. And so they continued in slavery through ignorance. Others did get the news, but the fear of leaving the confines that had provided a certain level of security to go back to the land of their, of their family, the fear withheld them and they continued in bondage. And while I was listening to this narrated book by Dora Murray, Holiness in Christ, I just thought if somebody doesn't tell the good news. How will they know? The ransom is paid, the blood is shed, Jesus is on the throne to give and enforce the freedom and to lead people out of bondage into his marvelous life. And the Apostle Paul felt that obligation. He felt the obligation that the price that Jesus was, had paid was worthy of his labor to make that good news known. And I, I really share that obligation and, and, and I know I need to do it even more, even more. Because he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 14, Paul says, so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things, uh, 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 these things that it should be done so to me, for it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do it willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with the stewardship. In other words, willingly or not, I've got to do it. What is my reward then, that when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel? Oh, my goodness, he says, for though I am free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all to win the more. The obligation that was in the Apostle Paul is what we need today. How many times? Is it not the same love of Christ that would compel us to not live any longer for ourselves? For as it is written, if one died for all, then all have died. Therefore, we should live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died for us and gave himself for us. First, second Corinthians 5 verse 14. You know, dear friends, I so yearn that that obligation is in us and that we aren't just motivated by pay or position or privilege or praise. I don't want to do what I do because I get praise from man or get paid for it. I want to do what I do because Jesus gave, paid such a high price and he is worthy of our service. The obligation is the great price that Christ paid. And, and, and it's grieved me sometimes how men will not go and share the love of Christ with others if they don't get paid or if they don't get a decent reward. And I know we can all be vulnerable to such, such things, especially when others take advantage of the service of others. Like the Apostle Paul says, those who preach the gospel should live up the gospel, that you should honor the man or woman of God and bless them. You should do it. But sometimes 
it doesn't happen, but, but let's be like Paul who says, no, I, I, I'm not going to look for that because that is not what obligates me. I am not obligated to money, I'm obligated to Christ. Money is not my master. I don't do what I do for money because then I have my reward right here on earth, but I seek a reward that gives glory to God and praise to God. And the Apostle Paul, what, what really drove his passion to be, to know that obligation, to live in that constraining obligation, because that is what obligation does. It constrains you, it confines you, it focuses you, it sets you for the course that that obligation demands. It, what really motivated him was the love of Christ. He said to the Philippian church, and I love this thinking, he says in chapter 1 of Philippians verse 8, he says, the love that I feel for you comes straight from the heart of Jesus. Oh, how I have experienced that love and love that love and how that love will compel me to get on a plane and fly to the other end of the world to minister to somebody without any thought of money or anything because that love is so much more valuable than all the money in the world. How sad when people don't know that love. Jesus said, the love with which I love you is the love of my Father. It's the love with which He loves me that I love you. Come and abide in the Father's love with me. John 15 verse 9. And you see that the Apostle Paul, he lived a life that demonstrated that love, which is what Jesus himself did. He says what, what, what he lived for was for the love of the Father to be made manifest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And here he's on his way to Rome where he will pass away in, in Acts chapter 26, right? And he says there in verse 19, Therefore King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. You see, the Apostle Paul was filled with that love through the revelation of Jesus. You must say, but Pastor, I don't know that love. Look for Jesus and you'll find it. He is the perfect expression of the love of the Father, the perfect embodiment of that love. You see, when Jesus appeared to Paul, he said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting you, persecuting me? It is not right for you to kick against the goats. What is the goats? It's a long stick with a sharp metal point on it by which the farmer prods the oxen into action when they're plowing the fields. And, and, and in other words, Jesus was saying to Paul, Paul, I have prodded you when you stood there while Philip was being stoned and you were hardened. You kicked against my prodding. You saw his face shining like my face, and yet you hardened yourself, Paul. Why? Why do you harden yourself against me? And Paul, he was transformed at that moment. He was transformed from an insolent, that's what he calls himself in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, an insolent heart, the chief of sinners in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. He calls himself the chief of sinners. How did he transform? It was the love. He says to, the, to Titus, he says, talking about meeting Jesus, he says, when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared unto man, he saved me, but not by my righteousness, but by his Spirit renewing me inwardly. You see, for Paul, he got a revelation of love when he met Jesus. You cannot preach Christ and not bring the love of the Father to people. It's not possible because He is the perfect expression of the love of the Father. Jesus, when He went to the cross, He said, um, He said, so that the world may know that I love the Father and the Father loves the world. Jesus came to reveal the Father's love for people. When the Father saw Christ's love for us, when He suffered for our sin, it was like sweet perfume to Him. There was such a sweetness of His love for us in suffering our sin. There was no begrudging, there was no resentment. There was no bitter taste to His sacrifice. It was perfect love for us when He suffered with our sin. And maybe you say, Pastor, I don't know this. I don't know this. 
And that you will never come to that real power of obligation unless you know the love of Christ, because that is what brings you into that sense of obligation that will compel you to pay any price, that will compel you to do whatever it takes to, to love people, to reach people, because it's the love of Christ that brings that true obligation that I'm talking to you about today. And many people have no sense of obligation. You know, I'm here at Life Church. We started the church in, in 1989, in October of 1989. That is 33 plus years ago. Why am I still here? Why do I feel I'm just beginning? Why are Virginia and I still here and feel we're just beginning? And many precious people have worked with us for all this time, all 33 years. Why? Because this love, this love of Christ is so renewing, refreshing, overwhelming. That's why I feel I'm just beginning. And it's the obligation. The obligation holds me in such a place that when we went through times of tremendous pain and suffering, and I was asked the question, why, why do you stay? Why not go and do something else? I said, I can't. There is nothing else for me. I'm obligated. I'm obligated by what? By the love of Christ, by His goodness and mercies that never fail, that are more new every morning. Oh, I love being obligated. I'm obligated to Virginia and not yield my soul to adultery, no matter what the circumstances of our marriage. Many men say, yeah, but I have no affection at home. Come on now, come on now. It has nothing to do with you being loyal. No, you're loyal for the love of God, for the love of Christ, for the love of goodness and mercy and truth. That's what obligates you to be loyal in your home. It's not because of your self-satisfaction. Are you some kind of hireling that only do what you do because you get paid? No, you're a true son of God. You do what you do because of the love of God. The same is true in the church. And in every area of life and ministry, the obligation that constrains us to be faithful and loyal is because we live to the praise and the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen. Have a good day.